Now we're off to almost 5,000 years ago. Let me take you to ancient Egypt, where back in 2550 BC, guess what? The construction of the Great Pyramids of Giza started. People learned to build cathedrals and skyscrapers, but it wasn't until recently that these massive buildings appeared. It's still a mystery to even modern scientists how these pyramids were built 5,000 years ago. No wonder they are one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. They're also the oldest of them and the only wonder of the ancient world that still exists in the 21st century. It must have taken a lot of cooperation to build a thing that massive, even for today's metrics. But the Giza pyramids weren't the first pyramids ever. The first one, called the Step Pyramid, was built around 80 years before the first pyramid of Giza, in 2630 BC, for King Djoser. It wasn't meant to be extraordinary, but ended up being quite impressive. It was a pyramid of six stepped layers of stone. It was 204 feet high, which is as tall as a 19-story building. And it was the tallest building that existed at that time. It wasn't just a pyramid, though. It was surrounded by a whole complex of buildings, including even courtyards. In ancient Egypt, people believed in the afterlife. So everyone, especially kings, wanted to make sure they had everything they needed to get ready for it. Here's why the pyramid complex was perfectly supplied with a lot of objects people used every day. The complex included a pyramid and a kind of a palace. Those buildings had many things the king loved and might need one day, like furniture, food, and gold vessels. After Djoser, building pyramids became common practice, but many pyramids weren't finished. It would usually take about 20 years to build one, but many rulers reigned way less than that. Overall, there are more than 100 pyramids. The most famous pyramids are the Great Pyramids of Giza. The first one and the biggest one was built for Pharaoh Khufu, around 2550 BC. Initially, it was 481 feet tall, which is as tall as a 40-story building. The second pyramid was built for Khufu's son, Pharaoh Khafre, around 2520 BC. It's just a bit shorter, usually standing at 471 feet high a 39-story building. This is the pyramid with the famous statue of the Sphinx. Sphinxes have a lion's body and a human head. They were built to guard important areas. This one has the head of Pharaoh Khafre and is guarding his pyramid, facing the sunrise. The Sphinx is most well-known and is one of the world's biggest and oldest statues. Originally, it had red color and did have a nose. It's still possible to see the trace of red pigment by its ears. But no one knows exactly when the nose disappeared. For some time, the Sphinx was sort of hidden underground, being covered with sand up to its shoulders. Luckily, in the early 1800s, an adventurer with a team of 160 people dug it out. The third pyramid of Giza is the smallest one, being more than twice shorter. Originally, it was 218 feet high, about the height of a 20-story building. Built in 2490 BC, it was a pyramid for Khafre's son, Menkar. The pyramids are designed to align with the points of the compass, and their sides symbolize the rays of the sun. But back at the time, there were no compasses. Ancient Egyptians figured out the directions themselves, and with amazing precision. To align the pyramids, they used two constellations. Originally, the pyramids were covered in smooth white limestone and had a gold-silver top to reflect the sun. Later, the white limestone was taken from the pyramids by other kings and used for other buildings. Scientists estimated that ancient Egyptians used about 2.3 million stone blocks to build the first pyramid. Each block weighed more than one ton. This is the weight of a rhino. Some blocks were even bigger, being almost as heavy as an elephant. Four and a half millennium ago, there was no modern equipment to help build it. There were no machines, no wheels, and even no steel. The only metal available to them was copper. Even today, scientists aren't sure how the Egyptians managed to build the pyramids. There are no records left that would shed light on it. Some even think that Egyptians wanted to keep it as their secret and didn't even record it on purpose. Many believe that poor people and foreigners built the pyramids, but it's not true. Actually, the builders were very skilled workers, and they were fed and paid well. The archaeologists claim that the builders lived in a nearby temporary city and were a highly organized community with a strong leader. Scientists say that around 20,000 people worked on each pyramid complex, and it took about 20 years to build each. It probably was a national project. 
the construction site was large in resources and food and essentials were likely to be contributed from all parts of Egypt. Even with all that support, it remains unclear how people managed to cut, transport, and assemble those huge stones. One of the theories suggests the stones were most likely transported on boats down the Nile River. Then, there was a harder part. They had to be moved to the construction site. For that, they probably used wooden sleds. It wasn't very hard to pull them because the sand mixed with the right amount of water was pretty slick. And 10 people could move a sled even with a rock weighing one ton pretty easily. Finally, one last problem. The stones had to be lifted and put into place. Archaeologists have discovered the remains of the ramps system that dates back to when the pyramids were built. Most likely, the Egyptians designed a unique system to move and pull huge stone blocks. But no one knows what it looked like exactly. The most common opinion is that there were several ramps around the pyramid to help move the blocks. The ramp was growing, with the pyramid getting higher. They suppose people were walking up the stairs, pulling the stone on the wooden sled up in the middle on the sandy ramp. But this is just one of the options. Others say that the ramps were going around the pyramid. Some say the ramps were inside the pyramid. But we'll never know for sure, and it'll forever remain a mystery, just like the ancient Egyptians wanted. Surprisingly, there's not much inside the pyramids. Most of it is just solid stone with very little open space. But let's take a quick look inside the biggest of the pyramids of Giza. From the entrance, there are two stairs, one going down and the other one going up. The descending one takes you to a chamber located underground. That's where the pharaohs are, but not in this pyramid because Khufu wanted to stay higher. The underground room is partly unfinished. The room with Khufu's sarcophagus is called the King's Chamber. It's upstairs and then through the tall and long Grand Gallery. Below the King's Chamber, there's a room called the Queen's Chamber. There are no queens though, and no one is sure why the room is called this. Unfortunately, none of these have any hieroglyphs on the wall. They're just bare. If you want to see them, you should go to the other rooms that are decorated. Those pieces of art are depictions of ancient Egypt's culture and daily life. The texts allow researchers to study their language and grammar. Sadly, the treasures that once were here in the pyramid are long stolen. From that room, there are several tunnels for an unknown purpose. There are many tunnels and passages inside the pyramids. There are many chambers and shafts and secret ways. Scientists have been sending little robots with cameras there for some decades already. And the robots did discover another chamber a bit upstairs with hieroglyphs on the walls. But even today, much of the pyramids is still unknown, and there's no so-called building plan of the pyramids. Egyptians did create a mystery no one can crack for 4,500 years already. Scientists recently started to x-ray the pyramid to learn what's inside it without entering it and its narrow, mysterious tunnels. You have heard about Nikola Tesla? You have definitely heard about the Great Pyramids in Egypt. But what if I told you that Tesla may have probably uncovered the ancient mystery surrounding the pyramids? Wait, what? Is this a crossover episode? Nope. It's highly probable that the secrets of the pyramids are hidden in plain sight. But first, let's recap what we know about the pyramids. What's so mysterious about them? I mean, they are just old quirky buildings, aren't they? One of the biggest questions is how they were built. Some people think that the pyramids were created by people using only their hands and muscles. But others think that there might have been some kind of crazy energy source that we don't know about yet. Like what if aliens helped out or something? Just kidding. But this idea of some unknown energy source being used to build the pyramids has been around for ages. Even in old texts, like the pyramid texts, it talks about how the gods gave us something to build a great power. So maybe there was something really powerful and mysterious going on back then? Who knows? Back in the early 1900s, he got obsessed with the Great Pyramids of Egypt. He read numerous books about these ancient structures and was blown away by how much energy they seemed to have. At that time, not many people knew much about electricity and Tesla started to wonder if there was some kind of advanced tech hidden in the pyramids. He had an idea that the power of the pyramids had to do with electromagnetism, and he put a lot of time and effort into trying to figure out the mystery. 
Tesla had some pretty unusual theories about the Great Pyramids. He thought that they could actually store and move electricity, which could then be used to power up the areas around them. He also had this theory that the pyramids were built using some kind of crystal energy. He believed that the chambers inside the pyramids could have these super powerful crystals that could control the electromagnetic fields. But that's not all. Tesla also had this idea that the materials used to make the pyramids had properties that allowed them to trap energy from the sun and the moon. And not just a little bit of energy. He thought that the pyramid could actually create this massive energy field that could light up whole cities or even brighten up dark places. He thought that the pyramids could be used as giant power plants to generate electricity and run machines. Tesla even believed that the pyramids were somehow linked to cosmic energy, which could be used for spiritual enlightenment and healing. How very new age of him. Anyway, Tesla wasn't just pulling these ideas out of thin air. He was seriously into studying everything he could about the pyramids, from ancient artifacts and texts to hieroglyphs and drawings. And he came up with this idea that the pyramids were designed to be energy amplifiers, and some kind of unknown energy source was used during their construction. Some people thought Tesla was eccentric for coming up with these theories, but his ideas have actually had a huge impact on the way we think about the pyramids today. Researchers and scholars have been digging into his theories for years and using them to uncover some of the biggest mysteries surrounding these ancient structures. For example, recently scientists have used theoretical physics to investigate how the Great Pyramid of Egypt would react to certain radio waves. They found out that if the radio waves were a certain length, the pyramid could concentrate the energy inside its rooms and focus it under its base. The scientists did lots of calculations to figure this out. They first thought about what radio wavelengths would work best. Then they made a model of how the pyramid would react to the waves. They figured out how much of the energy from the waves would get absorbed or spread out. Lastly, they checked how the energy would move around inside the pyramid when the waves hit it. To help explain all of this, the scientists used something called multipole analysis. This is when you take a complicated object and break it down into simpler parts. Then you can see how each part interacts with the energy that's coming in. It's like taking apart a puzzle to see how each piece fits together. The researchers are interested in how all of this can be used in the future. They want to make really tiny particles that can do the same thing as the pyramid, but with light. By changing the size, shape, and the material of these particles, they can control how the light moves around them. This can be really useful for things like making tiny sensors or super efficient solar cells. The scientists had to make some guesses when they were doing their research. They assumed that there weren't any hidden spaces inside the pyramid and that the material used to build it was all the same. But even with these guesses, they still made some pretty impressive discoveries. But the pyramid study is not the only proof that Tesla was ahead of his time. There are more Tesla's projects that seemed unrealistic at the time but that scientists and enthusiasts reevaluate and try to implement today. Let's talk about Tesla's most ambitious project, the Wardenclyffe Transmission Tower. Back in 1900, Tesla was already a big shot when it came to electrical engineering in America. People were blown away by his amazing inventions and the fact that he managed to outdo Thomas Edison in the battle of currents. However, Tesla wasn't content to rest on his laurels. He decided to embark on his most ambitious project yet, the transmission tower at Wardenclyffe. It was built between 1901 and 1905, and it was based on one of Tesla's breakthrough ideas. He had a vision to make the impossible possible by creating a global wireless communication system. It would use Earth itself as a conductor, transmitting music, news, stock market reports, secured military communications, and even facsimile images. Does it sound familiar? Right, it sounds just like the internet that we use today, only without the use of any wires. But Tesla had a much bigger dream in mind, to transmit power wirelessly. He already proved that high-frequency signals could be sent without any wires using his Tesla coil transformers, and this sparked his obsession with wireless energy transmission. His vision was to not only transform the way we communicate, 
but also to find a way to transfer power currents globally by tapping into the Earth's natural energy. Tesla believed that there was an abundance of free energy all around us that could be used for humanity's benefit. In 1899, he conducted some top-secret experiments and got convinced that it was possible to transmit electrical power through the Earth's upper atmosphere. This is actually how the Wardenclyffe Tower was created. It was supposed to be the prototype station for a network of towers all over the globe that would provide the whole world with wireless energy. Unfortunately, Tesla didn't have the resources or the patience of his investors to bring this project to fruition. It ran into all sorts of financial problems and roadblocks, and in 1917, the unfinished tower was finally torn down for scrap metal to pay off Tesla's mounting debts. Now it remains a sad reminder that even the greatest minds can sometimes fall short of their dreams. The original red brick laboratory, however, is still there, and it is the only Tesla lab that has survived. Fun fact, in 2017, a film crew made a crazy discovery. They used ground-penetrating radar to explore the area around Wardenclyffe, and they found a whole series of tunnels stretching for hundreds of feet underneath the site. Nobody knows exactly what these tunnels were used for, but people have been speculating for years that they were part of Tesla's grand plan. Wardenclyffe, of course, is a major landmark for Tesla enthusiasts from all over the world. Who knows, maybe someone will finally crack the mystery of the tunnels one day. But even if they don't, the legacy of Tesla and his amazing ideas lives on. The story goes that two Mayan twin boys love to play ball. Sure, they were really good at it, but they also made a lot of noise when playing. The lords of the underworld soon became bothered by the sound and summoned the two boys to the underworld, a place the Mayans called Xibalba. As soon as the boys reached their gloomy destination, the lords of the underworld began putting them through a series of tests. Soon enough, the inexperienced twin boys failed the tests and lost their lives. But this was not in vain. This sad event resulted in the appearance of a beautiful fruit tree. Soon enough, a young woman saw a beautiful fruit on this tree and reached up to pick it. Legend has it that soon after that, she gave birth to another set of twin boys named Hunapu and Jibalanqui. Just like their ancestors, these twins were great ball players, but they were equally as loud, and the lords of the underworld became annoyed again. They decided to ask this pair of twins to come to play a game in the underworld, hoping to get rid of them too. When the twins arrived, the lord sent them through a number of frightening places. The first one was the House of Gloom, which was very dark. They then passed through the House of Knives, where they had to avoid getting injured. The twins then built a fire in the House of Cold, so that they didn't freeze, and ran through the House of Jaguars, where they tricked the animals into not eating them. Finally, they entered the House of Bats, where they seemed to have lost their luck. One of the bats managed to run off with Hunapu's head. The lords then challenged the twins to play ball with them, but the boys were clearly at a disadvantage. Jibalanqui placed a turtle on Hunapu's shoulders to make up for his lost head, and they began playing. As the lords became distracted by an animal near the court, Jibalanqui stole his brother's head and placed it back in its place. Much to the annoyance of the lords, the twins were now able to tie the game. Hunapu and Jibalanqui continued to perform a series of tricks for the lords of the underworld. One of them involved Jibalanqui injuring Hunapu and then bringing him back to life. The lords were so impressed by the twins' performance that they asked them to do the same trick on them. Of course, the twins agreed, but after performing their trick on some of the lords, they refused to revive them. Seeing what had happened, the lords of the underworld admitted defeat and begged for their lives, promising not to intervene in the lives of people ever again. Hunapu and Jibalakwi were happy to have avenged their ancestors and gained the respect of the lords. Legend has it that the lords of heaven were so impressed by the twins that they took them to live in the sky by turning them into the moon and the sun. The Maya civilization was one of the most dominant indigenous societies in history, and their folklore and traditions are still discovered and studied today. They used to live in a territory called Mesoamerica, 
It was made up of modern-day Mexico and parts of Central America like Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, Yucatan Peninsula, and El Salvador. They lived from 1800 to 900 BCE and up to 900 to 1500 CE. Apart from their impressive legends, the Maya were very skilled inventors. They're known for their calendars, writing systems, farming methods, and sports. Their writing, for example, was found preserved on buildings and stone monuments, as well as in rare books and pottery. It's a system made out of more than 800 hieroglyphics in various combinations. Each of those signs was said to represent a syllable. Their writing system was deciphered by accident by Tatyana Proskoryakov, an American woman who initially studied to be an architect. Since she didn't find a job in her field, she eventually became a Mayanist in her own right, despite not being academically trained. She was the first to notice that the Mayan upended frog glyph meant birth and that their toothache glyph meant the date when the king ascended to the throne. It made it easier for scientists to pinpoint birthdays as well as the names of the rulers of a specific Mayan dynasty. They also invented the concept of zero, which is seen as one of the greatest innovations in mathematics, physics, and human history altogether. Sure, even back then, people understood the idea of having nothing, but the concept of zero as a number is a relatively new invention. A fun fact about Mayans is that they really liked hats. The bigger your hat was, the more important you looked. Not only was it a sort of fashion statement, but it also made them look taller, which was a big deal for their aesthetic. The Mayans also came up with one of the most intricate and complex calendars in human history. It was the first to use zero as a placeholder. Their calendar ended on December 21st, 2012, which led some people to believe that it translated to the end of the world. Obviously, that was not the case. It just so happened that the date coincided with the end of a Mayan cycle of years. But you know, as advanced in science and astronomy as they were, they did make some mistakes. One of them was their belief that the world was flat. Their theory was that the four corners of the world were watched by the brother lords, who kept the sky from falling over their lands. Hats off for their menus, though, as they were well-known chocolate eaters. They turned eating chocolate into a form of art. The drink they made wasn't really like the hot chocolate we enjoy today, though. The recipe included mixing cacao with water, honey, chili pepper, cornmeal, and other ingredients to make a foamy, spicy drink. The ritual of drinking cacao was a crucial part of their celebrations. We're not done discovering all the amazing parts of their architecture and civilization. It was only a few years ago that a Maya pyramid was found at Tonina in the Mexican state of Chiapas. It was estimated to be more than a thousand years old. The reason why it escaped archaeologists for so long was that it lay hidden under what was believed to be a natural hill. The ruins of two Mayan cities have been recently discovered in the Mexican state of Campeche. Why didn't we find them until now? Well, they were concealed by really thick vegetation, which made it difficult for archaeologists to reach them. The Mayans didn't just disappear. Their descendants are still around today, many of them choosing to live in their ancestral homelands. You can find them in Guatemala, for example, where the Maya people make up the majority of the population. Overall, the Maya ethnic group contains people that speak different Mayan languages, such as Yucatec, Quiche, Quechi, or Mopan. They had no idea what a spa day was, but the Mayans really enjoyed a nice sweat once in a while. Sweat lodges were discovered around ancient Mayan sites. They were built out of stone or adobe. These rooms were an essential part of their cleansing and healthcare rituals. One of the earliest sweat lodges was found in Quello in northern Belize and appeared to date back 3,000 years. One of the most important parts of the Mayan culture was a ball game which they named Pips. It had both political and spiritual significance. We can see ball courts at important parts of Mayan archaeological sites. The main goal of the game was to pass a rubber ball through a very high stone hoop without using your hands. Basically, it was a combination of soccer and basketball. 
However, it could have serious consequences. The loser could, at times, even lose his own life. Ooh, high stakes indeed! Because of this game and the need for bouncy balls, the Mayan people were some of the first cultures to use rubber. They made it using natural latex. There were different kinds of rubber depending on what natural substances the latex was mixed with. And that, my friend, is the way the ball bounces. Sorry, but you know me, I just couldn't resist. The Great Pyramid was created as the final resting place of ancient Egyptian monarch Khufu. According to legend, French leader Napoleon entered the Great Pyramid and came back out looking shaken and super pale. He never revealed what he saw inside, but whatever it was is said to have affected him for the rest of his life. When Napoleon entered the pyramid, he would have walked through a super tight and ascending passageway. He'd then go through another passageway known as the Great Chamber. This corridor would have been much taller than the previous one and would have cobbles too. He then reached the King's Chamber, the centerpiece of the Great Pyramid, which was lined with huge blocks of granite. But it wouldn't have looked as grand as we might imagine. There are no hieroglyphics decorating its walls, as Egyptians only began decorating the burial chambers of pyramids much later on. The pharaoh's tombs deep inside the pyramid would have also been filled with treasures, from chunks of gold to the world's most expensive jewelry. But this would have all been looted a long time ago. The only thing that probably would have been left in there would have been a huge sarcophagus, which would have once contained the king's mummy. He'd also have to walk past the queen's chamber. This room most likely didn't hold any queens though, as pyramids were usually only built for one person. There are mysterious tunnels leading from here. To this day, no one is really sure what they're there for. And that's not the only mysterious and creepy thing Napoleon may have encountered, as stories of pharaohs leaving ancient curses on pyramids go way back. Many pyramids had warnings written on the outside, telling of horrifying things that would happen to those who entered and disturbed the peace. We might not know what exactly Napoleon found in the Great Pyramid that scared him so much, but we know for sure what was found in Tutankhamun's tomb. Tutankhamun was an ancient Egyptian pharaoh who was only eight or nine years old when he took to the throne. He became a cultural phenomenon when his tomb was discovered almost completely intact in 1922. His pyramid sits in the Valley of Kings in Thebes, modern Luxor, which is in Egypt. Unlike the Great Pyramid, Tutankhamun's tomb was covered in beautiful wall decorations. The walls told the story of how he would travel to the afterlife through the underworld. Egyptians believed all people would have to take this journey, so they would fill their tombs with objects and paintings to help them get there. There'd also be spells painted on the walls. They believed this would help people pass over to the next realm. The journey would be pretty long, and for that reason, the ancient Egyptians would also fill the pyramids with food. Tutankhamun's pyramid was filled with eight fruit baskets. They even found something called gingerbread fruit in there. The rooms were jam-packed with furniture, statues, clothes, and staffs, amongst a whole bunch of other things. You'd likely find a lot of clothes and expensive jewelry in the pyramids as well. The ancient Egyptians wanted their ancestors to travel in style to the afterlife. They put Tutankhamun in his final resting place with over 50 pieces of clothing, all of the highest quality. There were tunics, scarves, gloves and headdresses, and a ton of jewelry. Bracelets, pennants, necklaces, rings, and scarabs for protection were all found inside. Each of them was made of gold or precious stones. There were also fans made of ostrich feathers to keep the old pharaoh cool in the hot Egyptian sun. But the temperature inside the pyramids never actually went above 68 degrees Fahrenheit. The ancient Egyptians developed a super cool air conditioning system that we don't fully understand even today. Tutankhamun's pyramid also contained 130 walking sticks made from ebony, ivory, silver, and gold to help him on his journey. There were three chariots hidden away in case he got tired of all the walking. They also put 11 boat paddles inside, but there was no sign of any boat. The pyramids would be littered with the pharaoh's favorite scents and perfumes. 
During the excavation of Tutankhamun's pyramid, it quickly became clear that it had been robbed during ancient times. There was damage to doors and traces of oils left in empty jars. It looks like someone raided the pyramid for gold and the scents, perfumes, and oils that had been left for King Tut. There was still a bit of perfume, which was made from coconut oil and frankincense, left in one bottle. It seems like Pharaoh Tutankhamun loved board games. There was an ivory traveling set of Senet in his pyramid. Although we don't know for sure exactly how to play it, we have figured out it was sort of an ancient Egyptian version of backgammon. It looks like it was a two-player game where the goal was to knock your opponent off the board. Not really sure who Tutankhamun's mummy was supposed to play with, though. The ancient Egyptians had some rituals that may seem pretty strange to us. For example, they used to shave their eyebrows off if they ever lost a cat. So it's not too surprising they put some really weird things inside pyramids. Archaeologists discovered a collection of mummified cats and scarab beetles in pyramids that date back more than 4,000 years. They were found in the pyramids of Saqqara, which is south of Cairo. They also found a bunch of makeup kits and mirrors inside. Makeup was worn proudly by both men and women in ancient Egyptian times. Eyeliner was the most popular cosmetic. The Rosetta Stone was one of the best discoveries ever made in pyramids. It was found by our man Napoleon Bonaparte and his team. It's a black granite rock that dates back to 196 BCE. It's transcribed in Greek, Demotic, and Hieroglyphic. When it was translated in 1822, we got the key to understanding ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics for the very first time. The discovery of Queen Hatshepsut's mummy in 1903 changed our understanding of the Egyptians forever. After she had passed away, her successor, Satmusi III, removed most of the evidence of her reign, so we basically knew nothing about Egypt's first great female leader. She's now gone on to become one of the few and most famous female pharaohs of Egypt. Pharaoh Khufu even had a fully-fledged boat in his pyramid. Archaeologists uncovered more than 1,200 pieces of a giant boat near the Great Pyramid at Giza. They reassembled the boat, and it's a whopping 144 feet long. It's most likely a solar boat, which was designed to carry the resurrected king with the deity Ra. Fun fact, the Pyramid of Giza is the last remaining of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The other six are the Hanging Gardens, the Colossus, the Temple of Artemis, the Mausoleum, the Lighthouse, and the Statue of Zeus. This pyramid was also the world's tallest man-made structure for 3,800 years, and it's the biggest pyramid in Egypt. It took a staggering 2.3 million blocks of limestone, and some weighed as much as 80 tons. It took an incredible 100,000 laborers and a whopping 23 years to build. Its original height was a mega 480 feet. In 2017, archaeologists discovered something weird about Egypt's Great Pyramid. There's a hidden void that's at least 100 feet long, and no one really knows why it's there or what's actually inside it. The weird void is the first inner structure discovered within the 4,500-year-old pyramid since the 1800s. Scientists used cosmic rays to detect the massive hole, but are still no closer today to finding out what's inside. The ancient Egyptians took a lot of care building the pyramids, and everything was strategically placed and structurally sound, so it's super unlikely that this hole is due to blocks falling over time. Loads of pyramids also contain small model figurines called Ushabti. These represented attendants. They believed they would come to life to serve the pharaohs in the afterlife. But it's amazing that all this stuff actually fit inside. There isn't actually a huge amount of space inside the structures. It's mostly just rock. Most people know that pyramids were built as grand tombs for the pharaohs, designed to ensure they had a smooth journey to the afterlife. The Great Pyramid of Giza, for instance, was constructed for the pharaoh Khufu. But what most people don't know is that this whole pyramid building trend started right here with the Step Pyramid of Djoser about 4,700 years ago. This massive structure was built for Pharaoh Djoser, a ruler from Egypt's third dynasty. It rises seven layers high above the ground and stands about 200 feet tall. We think of it today as a phenomenal architectural project. 
But for ancient Egyptians, the Step Pyramid of Djoser turned out to be more like a massive experiment, a trial run, if you will, to perfect their building skills before they moved on to even more ambitious pyramids. Reaching new heights is super exciting, but the real mystery is what is going on below the ground. In this pyramid's underground labyrinth, there is a network of tunnels stretching about three and a half miles long. And some researchers believe these tunnels might have been part of a sophisticated water system that could completely change what we think about pyramid construction. Let's talk about this massive complex located in Saqqara. Surrounding the pyramid, there's what's known as a dry moat, a continuous trench that is up to 164 feet wide and almost 2 miles long. It forms a sort of rectangular shape around the pyramid. This trench has an average depth of about 65 feet. Now, if you were to add up all the earth and rock they dug out to create this moat, it would be about 10 times the volume of the step pyramid itself. For the longest time, people just assumed this trench was nothing more than a huge quarry, a place where they dug up stone and clay to build the step pyramid. Makes sense, right? Hmm. But when you take a closer look, it doesn't add up. The trench is too narrow and deep to be practical for mining, and its layout doesn't match anything we know about ancient Egyptian quarrying methods. Plus, some sections of the trench are actually covered with a rocky ceiling, which would have made it nearly impossible to use as a quarry. Another theory suggests that the dry moat had some kind of spiritual significance. Maybe it was a sacred place, where souls of nobles gathered to serve the late king in the afterlife. There are even niches in the walls that work as a hint at this spiritual function. But most researchers believe that this purpose likely developed much later, long after the complex was built for Djoser. So what was the moat really designed for? In 2020, a researcher came up with a pretty intriguing idea. It is possible that this trench was actually designed to collect and manage water, especially after heavy rainfalls. Now, that makes sense when you consider the location. The moat sits in an area that could easily have been flooded by runoff water from nearby plains. This could also explain why the trench wasn't used for new graves until much later when the climate became drier and less prone to flooding. The story becomes even more intriguing, as this trench appears to be part of a larger, more complex hydraulic system within the Djoser complex. It is like the trench has several compartments, carefully carved out of the rock and connected by tunnels. These compartments likely served as a part of a water treatment system, where water would flow from one compartment to the next, getting cleaner as it moved along. Now, here is where things start to tie into the pyramid itself. The Djoser complex has a series of underground shafts, and some researchers think that water from the moat's deep trench might have been used to power a hydraulic lift system. And this giant water-powered elevator could have been used to raise the heavy stones needed to build the pyramid. It worked like a volcano, but instead of lava, water did the heavy lifting. Imagine a big deep hole in the ground at the center of the pyramid site. Inside this hole, there was a huge wooden platform, kind of like a giant raft that could move up and down. When the workers wanted to lift a heavy stone, they would fill the hole with water. As the water rose, the wooden platform started to float up, carrying the stone with it, almost like a giant water-powered elevator. When the stone reached the right height, the workers slid it off the platform and onto the pyramid. The idea is that water from the deep trench after being cleaned and filtered, would flow into these shafts. A massive float, possibly made of wood, would then rise as the water filled the shaft, lifting the stones up to where they were needed for construction. Once the stone was in place, they'd let the water out, lowering the platform back down to the bottom, ready to lift the next stone. This fancy hydraulic lift system could have been a game-changer, making the whole building process a lot faster and more efficient without using a lot of workforce. It is like the ancient Egyptians were already embracing the whole idea of work smarter, not harder. But of course, not everyone is on board with this theory. Some experts argue that the area where the step pyramid of Djoser was built 
couldn't have held enough water from occasional rains to maintain such a fancy hydraulic system. The main theory suggests that, in the past, there might have been some kind of lake nearby that would have filled up after a period of rain, and this lake could have supplied water to the complex's hydraulic system. But there is no mention of such a lake in any ancient Egyptian writings. So, it might be more of a what-if situation than a reality. And then there's the issue of the hard work itself. Remember when I said this method could have allowed the ancient builders to raise stones with far less effort? Well, that might not be entirely true. According to some experts, just building this hydraulic device would have required a lot more heavy work than simply moving the stone blocks using good old-fashioned manpower. And let's not forget, the step pyramid of Djoser is like a baby pyramid compared to those that came later. The stones used for Djoser's pyramid weighed, on average, about 660 pounds each, which is nothing compared to the more than 2.5 ton blocks used later for the pyramid of Chephren. If this cool water lift theory gets completely ruled out, we still need to explain how this pyramid was built in the first place. To answer that, we need to rewind a bit and talk about the original plans. See, before Djoser's tomb became a pyramid, the idea was to construct a simple mastaba. This type of tomb was pretty common in earlier periods – a flat-roofed, rectangular structure with sloping sides. But after the original mastaba was finished, they decided to expand it a bit by adding more layers on top. And then they added even more layers, until the construction reached six distinctive steps, each one smaller than the previous. And they probably did all this by raising those heavy stones using ramps not a water-powered elevator. There is still so much we don't know about the Step Pyramid of Djoser. More research is definitely needed to fully understand how this system worked, or if it even existed at all. But the idea of using water to help build the pyramid adds a whole new layer to our understanding of ancient Egyptian engineering. It's a powerful reminder of just how clever and resourceful those builders were using the natural landscape and the power of water to create one of the most iconic monuments in history. It's 1898, and you're taking part in excavations in Saqqara. This place, not far away from Cairo, is full of ancient tombs and pyramids. You're in your Indiana Jones mood and hope to find something really phenomenal to become famous. Gold, manuscripts, treasure maps, Mummies of famous pharaohs. Wait, a wooden bird? You're really disappointed as it looks like a regular toy. An old one, but still. Little do you know that years later, someone would propose that your bird was actually an ancient monoplane. So the artifact, nicknamed the Saqqara bird, is made of a sycamore tree. The birdie has a wingspan of just 7 inches and weighs around 40 grams. A perfect original souvenir from Egypt, I would say. It's over 2,000 years old and looks pretty plain, without any carvings of feathers or other intricate ornaments. It has a beak and eyes, though, which makes our find look like a hawk, the emblem of the deity Horus. Its tail is rather unusual as it's squared, looks weirdly upright, and it seems like the sunken part of it was the place for a now missing piece. Humans love solving a good mystery, so there have been several attempts to explain the use of the birdie. First, quite simply, is that it was a ceremonial object. The second idea is that it was a toy for a child from some well-off family. It could have been some sort of boomerang, which was a popular concept in ancient Egypt. Then there was a theory that the bird had been used as a weather vane. But this one has been debunked as the figure doesn't have any holes or markings except for the one made at the museum in Cairo to fix the exhibit on a stick. So there was no way to hang it in the past. Almost a century after the bird was found, Egyptologist Dr. Khalil Masiha proposed a new theory that it could have been a model of a monoplane. He believed the bird was missing a horizontal tailplane. Otherwise, it had its wings set at a right angle, similar to that of modern planes. It could have worked to generate the aerodynamic lift necessary for flights. 
Dr. Masiha also claimed that it was common at that time to place miniature models of technological inventions in tombs. So, did the ancient Egyptians really invent the plane in 200 BCE? That would make the Wright brothers, who are considered the inventors of aviation, really, really upset. They made one of their first flights only in 1903. There's just one way to know for sure, and that is to test the model. But you know the ancient museum in Cairo would unlikely let one of their cherished exhibits fly around like a toy. That's why glider designer Martin Gregory built a similar model, this time of balsa wood, and concluded that even with the missing tailplane, the plane wasn't much of a flyer. Case solved? Not really. This didn't sound convincing enough to the History Channel, so they invited an aerodynamics expert to build another replica of the bird. He tested it in weather conditions similar to those in Egypt and was impressed with the little plane's abilities. So, if they did invent the prototype of a plane back in the times of pharaohs, it would be a good example of an upart. That's an out-of-place artifact, an object that's way ahead of its time in terms of technology or history. And the Saqqara bird isn't the only example of such a revolutionary concept. In 1901, a group of divers retrieved the Antikythera mechanism from an underwater shipwreck near the Greek island of Antikythera. It's been dubbed the world's first analog computer, and it's currently dated around 100 BCE. The bronze mechanism could tell the position of the sun, moon, planets, and stars, as well as the lunar phase, the dates of upcoming solar eclipses, and even the speed at which the moon moves through the sky. No one's sure who used it and how or where it was made. But it's obvious that it's extremely precise and way too advanced for its time. The first flushing toilets in the world were invented in the middle of the 20th century. Just kidding. The ancient Minoans on the Mediterranean island of Crete and the Indus Valley civilization both came up with this brilliant invention at the same time, around 4,000 years ago. The plumbing and sanitation were so well done that no one managed to design anything better until 2,000 years later. One ancient Minoan lavatory was discovered at the Palace of Knossos. It looks like it had a wooden seat set over a tunnel that directed water from a rooftop reservoir to an underground sewer. Other varieties got water from jugs. Only the super rich people could afford all this glory. So if you wanted to shop for real estate back then, the flushing toilet would be a telltale sign you were in the rich neighborhood. Automated doors became a cool, seemingly new invention back in 1931. But the technology behind them is actually much older. Think the first century CE old. Mathematician and engineer Heron of Alexandria came up with a hydraulic system to open and close temple doors. To bring it into action, you need to light a fire to produce heat. There was a brass pot under the fire, half filled with water. The inventor connected the brass pot to containers that acted as weights. When the fire was burning, the water moved into the containers. They went down and pulled the ropes. It was nothing like a supermarket door that opens in front of you before you even have time to think. Heron's door took hours to open, and there was no way to stop the process. That's why they only opened the doors once a day before people entered the temple, to add some mysticism at the temple during ceremonies. Spooky! Looks like the first ever battery was invented in Baghdad around 2,000 years ago. A German archaeologist found this oval-shaped clay jar in 1938. Scientists are still not sure what purpose it served and who exactly invented it. There is a theory that it was used for electroplating objects with precious metals. When they filled it with a weak acid like vinegar, the battery produced around 1 volt of electricity. Another theory says it was a vessel for sacred scrolls. Would you like to buy contact lenses designed by Leonardo da Vinci himself? In 1508, 
he invented a glass lens with a funnel on one side. You were supposed to wear it with water inside to improve your vision. Sounds a bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? So, around a century later, French scientist René Descartes decided to improve the idea and make the cornea contact the future lenses. Contacts because they contact your eyes, get it? The glass tube with liquid did help improve vision, but blinking was sadly impossible. Two and a half centuries later, new technologies in the glass industry let scientists design contacts that would fit in the eye and even let the wearer blink. Thanks, guys! Still, those lenses were made of heavy blown glass and didn't let the eye breathe. About 50 years later, contacts became plastic, lightweight, unbreakable, and scratch resistant, but still covering the entire eye. And then, in 1948, an English optical technician accidentally sanded down a plastic lens and figured out they'd still be in place even if they covered only the cornea. Imagine you're living in 19th century London and need to send a message to New York. It would have taken about 10 days to get there by ship. So when delivery time went from days to hours in 1858, it was a true sensation. The first message was sent by Queen Victoria herself. It was all made possible thanks to the transatlantic telegraph cable running under the ocean. Sadly, the new cool invention only lasted a few weeks. It took years to bring it back to life. The year is 1923. Two teenagers sneak out of their homes in the middle of the night in Florida City. Rumor had it that an old man was building a rock castle by himself. But every time someone tried to see what the old man was doing, he would stop working. The curious teens managed to sneak into Ed's backyard and saw something they could later describe as magic. They recalled seeing rocks moving around like helium balloons. The old man was moving up to 30 tons of stone by himself to build his castle. Even if he didn't allow anyone to see him working, he would proudly talk about it around the town. But whenever people asked how he was building a stone castle all on his own, he simply answered, I cracked the secret of the pyramids. This story begins in Latvia, Edward Liedskalnin's home country. Edward was born in a small village on January 12, 1887. He was born in a family of stonemasons, which is probably where he learned ancient techniques of building. However, he grew up as a sickly boy, which meant he could never carry much weight or undergo heavy physical activity. At the age of 26, an unfortunate turn of events determined Ed's fate. The love of his life broke off their engagement and heartbroken Ed decided to move to the United States. He lived in a couple of American states before finally moving to Florida, where his life's adventure started. Ed spent years searching for the right spot of land to build his dream house. He always rejected good farmland. When people wondered why, he only smiled. Finally, when he bought land of his own, it was deemed terrible by his close friends. The soil was bedrock. He could neither plow nor farm it, but it seemed perfect for what he was seeking to build. Ed's close friends would often describe him as eccentric. When asked why he wanted to build a house, he would only say, it's for my sweet 16. Someday she's coming back. Then he changed the topic of the conversation. It took Ed about 30 years to finish Coral Castle, and he did it all by himself. He would only work under the cloak of night and never, never let anyone see what he was doing. The completed coral castle embodies a number of unsolved mysteries. If you were to visit the site back then, you'd have to go through a 9-ton, 8-foot tall revolving gate door that even a kid could push with just one finger. Ed was so proud of this door that he originally named the site Rock Gate Park. It was renamed Coral Castle only much later, after Ed's passing. Once inside, visitors would access the incredible wonders of Ed's constructions. Towers, mystic symbols, furniture, and swing sets, all made entirely of monolithic blocks of stone. The stones are set on top of each other, using only their weight to keep them together. And believe it or not, the entire park gathers around 1,100 tons of stone. 
Today, if you visit Ed's living quarters, you'll even see the simple instruments he used to construct all of this. Chisels, hammers, ropes, and pulleys. The type of work he did is difficult even with modern day equipment, let alone without it. Coral Castle's main mystery lies in how Ed managed to do it. The only photograph of Ed Leedskelnin at work shows a simple leverage structure of a chain hoist attached to a wooden tripod. The tripod was made of old telephone poles with a small wooden box on top. What was in the box is, of course, a mystery. Unfortunately, he took his secrets with him, not sharing the truth of his work with anyone else. Yet, not all is lost, as there are many theories and speculation surrounding what could have happened there. One theory says that there is a harmonic grid inside the Earth's surface, something that would create anti-gravity spots around the globe. It's believed that Coral Castle was built in such a spot. This could explain why it took Ed so long to find land that pleased him. Maybe what he was looking for was a place that allowed him to experiment with anti-gravity forces. Yet, whenever Ed talked about his work, he would say he understood the laws of weight and leverage, and, sure thing, that he had cracked the secret of the pyramid builders. And what secret is that, you might ask? According to Ed himself, it has to do with magnetism. He even published a pamphlet called Magnetic Current. There, he explains that every object has magnetic particles inside of them. A person just needs to understand where they are located inside such objects. This way, objects can be lifted and moved around without much effort, just like moving something heavy underwater. Researchers say that if we assume Ed Leedskelnin and the pyramid builders used the same technique, then it would only have taken 4,700 workers to build the Great Pyramid of Giza instead of the 20,000 to 100,000 that is currently estimated. But this story just keeps on getting more and more mysterious. In the late 1920s, Ed was finishing the construction of Coral Castle in Florida City. Rumors about his work had spread around town. People said Ed was hiding a stash of money somewhere in his living quarters. One night, a group of men waited until Ed was alone and broke into the castle to rob him. They couldn't find the money and, luckily, didn't harm Ed. But in the following days, he decided that it was best he moved out of that land. Of course, he took more than his toothbrush along with him. Ed decided to move the entire coral castle to another land 10 kilometers away from where he had built the park. Legend says he hired a truck driver and asked him to swear secrecy about what Ed intended to do. He asked the driver to look away while Ed loaded the truck by himself, moving all of the rocks without any help. With the truck loaded, Ed and his castle moved to Homestead, Florida, where the park is located until this day. In 1986, a group of engineers from Florida University was called to try to fix the park's gate entrance, the nine-ton revolving door that Ed was so proud of. They arrived with plenty of modern-day equipment, including a 20-ton crane. When the engineers took the door down, they noticed that Ed had used a strange circular stone at the bottom of the revolving door. The engineers couldn't understand how this frisbee-sized rock could withstand nine tons of weight without breaking into pieces. They sent the rock to the geology department at the University of Florida, but the geologists simply returned the rock, saying they couldn't find a match of this rock in their databases. They couldn't determine its origin. The engineers put the nine-ton gate back into place, trying to use other techniques. At first, it didn't work without the base rock Ed had originally used. So, they had to cut the gate rock to make it work as a revolving door once again, proving that modern-day technology couldn't replicate what Ed had done single-handedly. Fast forward to 2011, and another man claimed to have cracked the code of the pyramid builders and Ed Leedskelnin himself. Wally Wallington, a retired construction worker from Lapeer County, Michigan, has managed to build using similar techniques to those used by Ed. Wallington is known for having built his personal Stonehenge in Michigan. 
He is said to have used simple machines, such as levers and counterweights, moving around multi-thousand pound concrete blocks. Unlike Ed, Wallington has shared his techniques with the public. Multiple videos are showing the clever engineering he built from very simple materials. It sure is impressive. The man has moved his entire barn into another property just with the help of simple tools. However, there is no way to prove that these were the same techniques used to build Coral Castle. To this day, the secrets of Coral Castle haven't been unraveled. But hey, we can always keep trying to solve it. And now we're off to almost 5,000 years ago. Let me take you to ancient Egypt, where back in 2550 BC, guess what? The construction of the Great Pyramids of Giza started. People learned to build cathedrals and skyscrapers, but it wasn't until recently that these massive buildings appeared. It's still a mystery to even modern scientists how these pyramids were built 5,000 years ago. No wonder they are one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. They're also the oldest of them and the only wonder of the ancient world that still exists in the 21st century. It must have taken a lot of cooperation to build a thing that massive, even for today's metrics. But the Giza pyramids weren't the first pyramids ever. The first one called the Step Pyramid was built around 80 years before the first pyramid of Giza in 2630 BC for King Djoser. It wasn't meant to be extraordinary, but ended up being quite impressive. It was a pyramid of six stepped layers of stone. It was 204 feet high, which is as tall as a 19-story building. And it was the tallest building that existed at that time. It wasn't just a pyramid, though. It was surrounded by a whole complex of buildings, including even courtyards. In ancient Egypt, people believed in the afterlife. So everyone, especially kings, wanted to make sure they had everything they needed to get ready for it. Here's why the pyramid complex was perfectly supplied with a lot of objects people used every day. The complex included a pyramid and a kind of a palace. Those buildings had many things the king loved and might need one day, like furniture, food, and gold vessels. After Djoser, building pyramids became common practice, but many pyramids weren't finished. It would usually take about 20 years to build one, but many rulers reigned way less than that. Overall, there are more than 100 pyramids. The most famous pyramids are the Great Pyramids of Giza. The first one and the biggest one was built for Pharaoh Khufu, around 2550 BC. Initially, it was 481 feet tall, which is as tall as a 40-story building. The second pyramid was built for Khufu's son, Pharaoh Khafre, around 2520 BC. It's just a bit shorter, usually standing at 471 feet high a 39-story building. This is the pyramid with the famous statue of the Sphinx. Sphinxes have a lion's body and a human head. They were built to guard important areas. This one has the head of Pharaoh Khafre and is guarding his pyramid, facing the sunrise. The Sphinx is most well-known and is one of the world's biggest and oldest statues. Originally, it had red color and did have a nose. It's still possible to see the trace of red pigment by its ears but no one knows exactly when the nose disappeared. For some time, the Sphinx was sort of hidden underground, being covered with sand up to its shoulders. Luckily, in the early 1800s, an adventurer with a team of 160 people dug it out. The third pyramid of Giza is the smallest one, being more than twice shorter. Originally, it was 218 feet high, about the height of a 20-story building. Built in 2490 BC, it was a pyramid for Khafre's son, Menkar. The pyramids are designed to align with the points of the compass, and their sides symbolize the rays of the sun. But back at the time, there were no compasses. Ancient Egyptians figured out the directions themselves, and with amazing precision. To align the pyramids, they used two constellations. Originally, the pyramids were covered in smooth white limestone and had a gold-silver top to reflect the sun. Later, the white limestone was taken from the pyramids by other kings and used for other buildings. Scientists estimated that ancient Egyptians used about 2.3 million stone blocks to build the first pyramid. Each block weighed more than one ton. This is the weight of a rhino. Some blocks were even bigger, being almost as heavy as an elephant. Four and a half millennium ago, there was no modern equipment to help build it. There were no machines, no wheels, and even no steel. The only metal available to them was copper. 
Even today, scientists aren't sure how the Egyptians managed to build the pyramids. There are no records left that would shed light on it. Some even think that Egyptians wanted to keep it as their secret and didn't even record it on purpose. Many believe that poor people and foreigners built the pyramids, but it's not true. Actually, the builders were very skilled workers, and they were fed and paid well. The archaeologists claim that the builders lived in a nearby temporary city and were a highly organized community with a strong leader. Scientists say that around 20,000 people worked on each pyramid complex, and it took about 20 years to build each. It probably was a national project. The construction site was large in resources, and food and essentials were likely to be contributed from all parts of Egypt. Even with all that support, it remains unclear how people managed to cut, transport, and assemble those huge stones. One of the theories suggests the stones were most likely transported on boats down the Nile River. Then, there was a harder part. They had to be moved to the construction site. For that, they probably used wooden sleds. It wasn't very hard to pull them because the sand mixed with the right amount of water was pretty slick. And 10 people could move a sled even with a rock weighing one ton pretty easily. Finally, one last problem. The stones had to be lifted and put into place. Archaeologists have discovered the remains of the ramps system that dates back to when the pyramids were built. Most likely, the Egyptians designed a unique system to move and pull huge stone blocks, but no one knows what it looked like exactly. The most common opinion is that there were several ramps around the pyramid to help move the blocks. The ramp was growing, with the pyramid getting higher. They suppose people were walking up the stairs, pulling the stone on the wooden sled up in the middle on the sandy ramp. But this is just one of the options. Others say that the ramps were going around the pyramid. Some say the ramps were inside the pyramid. But we'll never know for sure, and it'll forever remain a mystery, just like the ancient Egyptians wanted. Surprisingly, there's not much inside the pyramids. Most of it is just solid stone with very little open space. But let's take a quick look inside the biggest of the pyramids of Giza. From the entrance, there are two stairs, one going down and the other one going up. The descending one takes you to a chamber located underground. That's where the pharaohs are, but not in this pyramid because Khufu wanted to stay higher. The underground room is partly unfinished. The room with Khufu's sarcophagus is called the king's chamber. It's upstairs and then through the tall and long grand gallery. Below the king's chamber, there's a room called the queen's chamber. There are no queens though, and no one is sure why the room is called this. Unfortunately, none of these have any hieroglyphs on the wall. They're just bare. If you want to see them, you should go to the other rooms that are decorated. Those pieces of art are depictions of ancient Egypt's culture and daily life. The texts allow researchers to study their language and grammar. Sadly, the treasures that once were here in the pyramid are long stolen. From that room, there are several tunnels for an unknown purpose. There are many tunnels and passages inside the pyramids. There are many chambers and shafts and secret ways. Scientists have been sending little robots with cameras there for some decades already. And the robots did discover another chamber a bit upstairs with hieroglyphs on the walls. But even today, much of the pyramids is still unknown, and there's no so-called building plan of the pyramids. Egyptians did create a mystery no one can crack for 4,500 years already. Scientists recently started to x-ray the pyramid to learn what's inside it without entering it and its narrow, mysterious tunnels. We know that the ancient Egyptians were talented enough to build something as grand as the pyramids, but were they also smart enough to measure the speed of light? There's a theory circulating online that says exactly that. If you look at these two numbers, you'll see that they match completely. The first one is the speed of light in a vacuum measured in meters. And the second one is the latitude of the Great Pyramid of Giza. So was it done on purpose, or is it just a coincidence? Well, happily, we can tell you that it's actually just a coincidence, not another conspiracy thingy. The Great Pyramid is just one of the many places in the world that share the same latitude. And more importantly, even if the ancient Egyptians had somehow measured the speed of light and chosen to keep it a secret from the rest of the world, they wouldn't have used meters to put it down. Meters were only defined at the end of the 18th century. The builders of the pyramids used a different unit of measure called cubits. One cubit is equal to one and a half feet. 
Cubit was based on the length of the arm from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger, and it became popular in the ancient world. So if they wanted to impress the rest of the world and set the pyramids at a point that matched the speed of light in cubits, they would have to build their iconic constructions somewhere in Europe. And then the Danish astronomer who first measured the speed of light in 1676 would have been really upset to know that someone had done it centuries before him. So although they were ahead of their time in many aspects, the ancient Egyptians never measured the speed of light or used longitude and latitude to map their locations. The base of the Great Pyramid of Giza might seem like a perfect square, but it's actually an eight-sided structure, not four-sided. Each of its four sides has a subtle concave indentation that splits it evenly from base to tip. The official version is that a British pilot was the first to notice it in 1940 while flying over the pyramid. He took a photograph that showed shadows highlighting these indentations. Some people think these lines are only visible from above and can best be seen at dawn and dusk during the spring and autumn equinoxes. This has led to a freaky theory that the ancient Egyptians might have designed the pyramids to communicate with something looking at them from above. Uh huh. Now, the Great Pyramid is one of only three pyramids that used to have a swivel door. It weighed around 20 tons, but they could still easily open it from the inside. Its precise fit made it nearly invisible from the outside, with no visible latch or handle. There were only slight variations in the exterior stone that gave out an opening. The other two pyramids with similar doors belong to Khufu's father and grandfather. The Great Pyramid also has a hidden void at least 100 feet long that was only found in 2017. We still don't know what lies within the space, what purpose it served, or if it is the only space of its kind. Researchers use the same tech to see through cathedral walls, Mayan pyramids, and even volcanoes. It depends on a natural shower of subatomic particles called muons. They pass more easily through empty space than through solid materials. So if they arrange multiple muon detectors around a structure, scientists can map out its solid and empty areas. A team of scientists placed muon detectors inside the Great Pyramid and allowed them to gather data for months. Scientists have analyzed samples of the mortar used to build the pyramid many times. Although we know its composition, modern technology still can't replicate it. The mortar is mostly made from processed gypsum, but it wasn't used like the cement we use for bricks today. Instead, they used it to support the joints between the massive stones as they were set in place. The estimated amount they needed to construct the Great Pyramid was around half a million tons of mortar. The gypsum mortar is stronger than the stones themselves and has held up for thousands of years. Now, all four sides of the Great Pyramid are aligned with the cardinal points – north, south, east, and west. According to geologist and engineer Glenn Dash, the alignment is accurate to within 4 minutes of arc, or 1 15th of a degree. The architects managed to achieve this without modern tools like drones, blueprints, or computers. Many researchers tried to explain this construction miracle. Maybe they used the pole star or the sun's shadow. Dash recently proposed a new simpler idea. The Egyptians might have used the autumnal equinox to align the pyramids. It happens twice a year when the Earth's equator passes through the center of the Sun's disk, making day and night nearly equal in length. To test his theory, Dash conducted an experiment on the 22nd of September 2016, the first day of the fall equinox. He used a special rod the Egyptians had to cast a shadow and track its tip at regular intervals, forming a smooth curve. By connecting two points of the curve with a taut string, he created an almost perfect east-west line. Dash noted that on the equinox, the shadow's tip runs in a straight line, nearly perfectly east-west, and with a slight counterclockwise error. There's a similar error in the pyramids. Although his experiment was conducted in Connecticut, Dash believes that the same method would work in Egypt. All the ancient Egyptians needed was a clear, sunny day. They could determine the fall equinox by counting 91 days from the summer solstice. But they left us few clues, and no engineering documents or architectural plans have been found that explain their methods. So they might have mapped shadows, but it's not definite. Now scientists have long wondered how heavy stone blocks were carried to the pyramid sites, and they might finally have an answer. 
A research team from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, has discovered that 31 pyramids are likely to have been built along a long-lost ancient branch of the River Nile. It's now hidden under desert and farmland. For many years, archaeologists have thought that ancient Egyptians must have used a nearby waterway to transport materials, equipment, people, and whatever else they needed to build the pyramids on the river. But up until now, they weren't certain of the location, shape, size, or proximity of this waterway to the site of the pyramids. The group of researchers used radar satellite imagery, historical maps, geophysical surveys, and sediment coring to map the river branch. They believe it was buried by a major drought and sandstorms thousands of years ago. The team managed to go below the sand surface and get images of some hidden features thanks to radar technology. They found hidden rivers and ancient structures running at the foothills of where most of the ancient Egyptian pyramids lie. The discovery of this extinct river branch helps explain the high pyramid density between Giza and Lish, in what is now an inhospitable area of the Sahara Desert. Now, Egypt isn't the only country with the most pyramids in the world. The champion's title here goes to its southern neighbor, Sudan. It has between 200 and 255 pyramids, compared to Egypt's measly 138. They were built by members of the Kingdom of Kush, an ancient civilization that ruled the lands along the Nile River many years ago. They started erecting pyramids around 500 years after the Egyptians had stopped doing it. Their pyramids are much smaller than the Egyptian ones, but were built for the same purposes. Archaeologists are still working to find out how the pyramids in the Sudan were built, how long it took to complete them, and what happened to their system. Imagine working seven days a week on a large-scale construction site. You, along with thousands of others, carry millions of stone blocks and put them on top of each other according to a complex system. You work without modern construction equipment. You have no air conditioning or constant access to water. It's so hot outside that you can fry eggs on the road. You've been building the pyramid for decades. And now, when it's finally done, you enjoy the result of the colossal work of thousands of people. You're looking at a giant cultural monument of global value that will freeze in time and amaze people for tens of thousands of years. A few thousand years have passed. People in the 21st century see the pyramids and are like, wow, I can't believe humans have built this. Yeah, the people who built the pyramids wouldn't have appreciated such a theory. But actually, there are reasons to believe that people built it using some fantastic technology. From the outside, it seems the Great Pyramids are just big triangles of stone. People just put some heavy blocks on top of each other and that's it. In fact, the design seems too perfect to be true. The pyramid consists of more than 2 million blocks. They lay so close to each other and are so even that you couldn't squeeze even a thin sheet of paper between them. Scientists still can't figure out the exact technology for building the Egyptian pyramids. One of the biggest and most famous is the Great Pyramid of Giza. This huge construction, well known all over the world, has one big secret. There should be a capstone on top of the pyramid. It's a triangular shaped stone block, a small pyramid on top of a huge one. It's also called a pyramidion. The builders of ancient Egypt made it out of granite and limestone and covered it with gold. No records or old drawings prove that there was a pyramidion at the top of the Great Pyramid of Giza. But there's another ancient Egyptian structure with such a triangle, the Red Pyramid. It was built before the Great One, and its capstone has survived to this day. Archaeologists have found and reconstructed it. But where could the capstone of the Great Pyramid be? It's a mystery that still has no answer. Some are sure that some thieves have stolen it from the top. Maybe they just climbed up and pushed the Pyramidion down. It makes perfect sense. The capstone was probably the most valuable element of the pyramid. Many scientists and archaeologists still don't know its exact purpose. Some believe that this peak covered with gold glorified the pharaohs. The capstone reflected moonlight at night and illuminated the entire space around it. During the day, 
The capstone reflected sunlight with its shiny surface. You could have noticed it from afar. The top of the pyramid was a kind of guiding star for lost travelers. All other stone blocks of the pyramid consist of limestone. People polish them to make them look shiny. In the past, they were even glowing and reflected light. You could see glowing pyramids from space, although they looked like tiny lights. Over thousands of years, winds, sandstorms, and rains have changed the pyramid's appearance. If people had taken care of them all this time, they would have looked like something out of science fiction movies or the pyramids from Las Vegas. But unfortunately, we will never see their original appearance. Some archaeologists and scientists believe that the capstone could absorb the sun's energy and distribute it evenly throughout the pyramid. No one knows precisely why the Egyptians needed this technology. There's a theory the pyramids are ancient energy systems. The pharaohs applied this energy to use some unique technologies that were more advanced than all the achievements of the 21st century. And the triangular shape of the pyramids was ideal for boosting this electromagnetic energy. In theory, solar radiation, or electromagnetic forces, accumulated at the top of the pyramid, filled the inner rooms, and then went down the walls to the base. Any surface distortion could prevent the flow from spreading, so they had to create a perfectly smooth surface. That's why they installed the blocks, so that nobody could squeeze a needle or razor blade between them. Many people believe in this theory because they built the pyramids from limestone. This material can hold energy inside itself. In the inner part, they created granite deposits to cause air ionization, that is, to create an electric charge. They also dug channels under the pyramid for water to transmit electricity. And at the top, they put a gold capstone, the best conductor of electricity. So this is how you get a great power generator. Different cultures used similar technologies to create electricity all over the world. But these are all theories. If it had been working, humanity would have used these technologies today. There are mentions of the metal industry, chemistry, engineering, physics, mathematics, and astronomy in some ancient records. Most scientists don't believe in all these things. We know the detailed stages of the technology's development in different cultures. In the 21st century, scientists, historians, and anthropologists can track the evolution of all modern devices. If people had created some technological inventions in ancient times, the history of the world would have looked different. Perhaps all the achievements of antiquity could have been wiped off the face of the Earth by global cataclysms. And it can happen to us. Just imagine how people would dig up a laptop in 5,000 years. Perhaps they wouldn't understand what kind of device it is. Another Egyptian wonder surrounded by mystery is the statue of the Sphinx. The Egyptians carved it out of a single massive piece of limestone about 4.5 thousand years ago. But scientists still don't know the exact date of its construction or who built it. People painted the Sphinx in different colors, so it looked much brighter and more vivid in the distant past. It was shining just like the Great Pyramids. Anyway, time hasn't only changed its appearance, but its name too. Initially, the Egyptians called it Horemeket. The Greeks renamed it the Sphinx about a few hundred years after it had been built. The Sphinx emphasized the greatness of the rulers of Egypt. It also performed a symbolic function of a watchdog guarding the tomb of the pharaoh and the paths leading to it. This version sounds realistic, since archaeologists have discovered many secret entrances at the foot of the Sphinx. Perhaps these rooms and intricate tunnels lead to underground halls with treasures. And treasures don't always mean gold and jewelry. According to legends and theories, the Sphinx guards the Hall of Records, the storage of all humankind's knowledge. The information about the ancient mythical state of Atlantis could be there. You can find many detailed maps of the internal dungeons of the Sphinx on the internet. They show structures 12 stories deep under the statue. 
It looks like a small city filled with gold, scrolls of knowledge, and various ancient artifacts. But don't believe all these maps. These are just theories. Several thousand years have passed, but people have very little information about it. Archaeologists know that there are still many strange and exciting things about the Sphinx that are still undiscovered. Some locals are afraid to research because they believe they can awaken something terrible from the underground depths. Therefore, it's mostly scientists from other countries who conduct the excavations. In 1998, scientists discovered strange tunnels leading to empty rooms under the Sphinx. They realized that some people tried to get there through tunnels in the past. And maybe those people took all the treasures that were there. One of the legends says that some powerful artifact lays beneath the Sphinx. Its technology can change the whole world, but the locals are hiding it because it can damage the planet. Some believe that you can find evidence of unknown technologies painted on the granite walls in the pharaoh's tombs. But most likely, these paintings and signs tell us the myths and legends of ancient Egypt. But what if Egyptian symbols and drawings are detailed instructions for using ancient technologies? What if the locals that lived at that time thought, hmm, people in the future won't be able to get energy themselves. Let's leave some detailed instructions for them. Anyway, there are many riddles and theories. In reality, the search for answers is a dangerous undertaking, since it's not easy to get into the underground halls. Excavations can ruin the structure of the entire Sphinx. Any person inside the tunnels may get lost and never be able to find their way back. Besides, it costs a lot of money. Now what would be awesome is if people could invent some device that could scan underground areas and show their detailed models. Before we get into the reason why and how there are pyramids all around the world, Let's talk about some of the examples. I'll start with the Pyramid of the Sun in Mexico. These folks really knew how to build a city. Their well-planned urban center spanned over seven square miles and boasted several pyramids. But the Pyramid of the Sun is the most impressive. This giant pyramid was built way back in 100 CE and is one of the biggest structures of its kind in the whole Western Hemisphere. It's so big that it's 216 feet high above the ground. If you ever find yourself in this ancient city, you won't be able to miss the Pyramid of the Sun. It's right there on the east side of the Avenue of the Dead, the city's main north-south street. To build this incredible pyramid, around 1 million cubic yards of material were used, including a special kind of red volcanic rock called Hugh Tezontal. Impressive, huh? We don't know too much about the people who built the Pyramid of the Sun or its purpose. But archaeologists believe there was once a temple on top of it. When explorers went below the pyramid in the 1970s, they found a bunch of cool tunnels and chambers. In 2011, they even found a secret stash of clay pots, obsidian pieces, animal bones, human figurines, and a mask. Who knows what other secrets the pyramid is hiding? If you decide to see this one, you must climb the pyramid using the 248 uneven steps on the west side. Watch your step. Sudan got some pyramids too. Nubian pyramids aren't as big as the ones in Egypt, but they still got around 200 of them. These ancient pyramids have been home to the tombs of the pharaohs of the Meroitic Kingdom for almost a thousand years, who ruled Egypt from Nubia to the Mediterranean Sea. The pyramids at Meroe were constructed using granite and reddish sandstone. Oh, and did you know that Sudan has more ancient pyramids than Egypt? The Kushite pyramids depict the indigenous architecture and burial traditions of Nubia's Napata and Meroe kingdoms, which ancient Egypt influenced. Meroe, the burial site of over 40 queens and kings, is the most extensive Nubian pyramid site. The tomb walls depict mummified royals bedecked in jewelry, their wooden caskets containing bows, quivers of arrows, 
and other artifacts pointing to the Meroitic relationship and trade with Egyptian and Greek civilizations. So if you're looking for some ancient tombs to explore, you may consider skipping the crowds in Egypt and heading on down to Sudan. Let's fly to Iraq to see some more pyramids. Ziggurats have fancy receding layers and tiered temples. Instead of a smooth exterior, it has tiers like a cake. Perfect for all the important work and rituals that went on inside. You can find these towering structures scattered throughout Iraq and Iran, and they're a real testament to the power and skills of the people who built them. One of the biggest and most impressive ziggurats is the Ziggurat at Ur. It's basically a giant rectangular pyramid that stands a whopping 70 to 100 feet tall, with three levels of terraces and a temple on top. Can you imagine how many baked bricks it took to build that thing? Try 720,000 for just the lower portion. This particular ziggurat was built for Sumerian king ur Nammu. Similar to other ones, this pyramid has been around for thousands of years. So it got a little rough around the edges. Thankfully, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II and some archaeologists came to the rescue in the 6th and 20th centuries respectively. And now, you can find this near Talil Air Base. The ziggurat at Ur was built in 2100 BCE by King Ur Namu for the moon deity Nana. It was the tallest building in the city and you could see it from miles around. It was like the medieval cathedral spire of its day. People would come here to bring their agricultural surplus and get their food allotments and seek spiritual nourishment. Sadly, the Nana temple at the top of the ziggurat didn't survive, but we do have some blue glazed bricks that may have been part of its decoration. The lower parts of the ziggurat are pretty amazing though. The architects even included holes in the temple's baked exterior to let the water evaporate from its core. Since we explored some of the pyramids on our planet, let's take a broader perspective. They can be found in many parts of the world. Egypt has over 100 pyramids, double that number in Sudan, and dozens of others are scattered in the Middle East and China. The Americas have the most pyramids in total, with more pyramids than the rest of the world combined. These pyramids are located in Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Time to know more about the evolution of pyramids through history. The oldest pyramid is in Egypt. This pyramid was a step pyramid, which was created by placing one layer of stone on top of another. The pharaoh Sneferu is credited with creating the pyramid shape we recognize today. During his 45-year reign, he built three pyramids. His first two attempts failed, but he finally got it right with the Red Pyramid, which is considered the first true pyramid. It was Sneferu's son, Khufu, who built the Great Pyramid of Giza, which was the tallest human-made structure on Earth for almost 4,000 years. Latin American pyramids are similar to early Egyptian step pyramids, but they were built independently, with no knowledge of each other. The pyramids in Sudan were built around 700 BCE and are tall, but much narrower than those in Egypt. How in the world did all these civilizations build these things without even texting each other? After all, the Aztecs, Mayans, and ancient Egyptians were about as different as possible. But despite their cultural differences, they all seem to agree on one thing. Pyramids were pretty cool. Step pyramids are all around the world because they were the most feasible and stable way to build large and tall structures without access to lighter building materials like wood and metal. The triangular form with a square base is the best way to build a sturdy structure, and having a cube structure would require more material for less height. Now, when it comes to pyramid design, the Egyptian pyramids were like giant triangles with a square base, smooth sides, and a pointy top. On the other hand, the Aztecs and Mayans went for a tiered cake look, with steps leading up to a flat platform on top. 
So, while all these pyramids share the same basic shape, they have their own unique flair. Each group built its pyramids using different materials, techniques, and slope angles. So while they may have been inspired by each other's work occasionally, they were just doing their own thing. Egyptian pyramids had smooth, angled sides that were designed to help the pharaoh's soul ascend to heaven. The Pyramid of the Sun was built over a series of caves that served as a passageway for the deities. The Maya built the temple of Kukulkan in Chichen Itza to honor the deity Kukulkan, usually represented by a serpent. Nicknamed El Castillo, it has 91 steps on each side, plus a platform. That's 365 steps, one for each day of the Mayan calendar. Tell me, Brightsiders, how were pyramids built? To begin with, humans made them, not a foreign race from space that landed on Earth. You see, one thing that all pyramids have in common is that they were built without advanced tools or even the wheel. It took a lot of people to build them, including skilled laborers and architects. For example, it's estimated that 20,000 people built the Great Pyramid of Giza, and it's believed that most of them were skilled laborers. Building pyramids was a massive undertaking that required years of planning and effort. The Great Pyramid at Cholula, Mexico took 600 years to complete.